Hello everyone and welcome back to English 1110. Generally, I don't record both lectures on the same day, but the first week of the semester, I typically do because it just happens that way. Um, thank you again for your enduring patience with my cat kind of losing it in the last lecture and hopefully, fingers crossed, um, she will cool it for this one. So this is your first in-depth lecture for English 1110. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that we can dive into the content for this week. All right, so hopefully you have come fresh off of watching um, the other lecture as well as kind of reviewing the materials that are listed in the um, schedule of assignments um, and specifically for this week's um, information. And so this in-depth lecture is titled An Essay in Action and it is for May 12th to May 15th. Again, I'm Caitlin Marisol Sweeney and you can call me KS, Case Swizzle, Professor Sweeney, Instructor Sweeney, uh, and my email is sweeney.464 at buckeyemail.osu.edu. Okay, so today's agenda is to break down the process of how to analyze a text, key, concept, uh, key concepts for English 1110, and to discuss the prompt for discussion board post number one. Okay, so how to analyze a text, let's just dive into it. Now, the prompt for discussion board post number one is that I'm going to ask that you, you know, as you should have already done coming into this lecture, watch the music videos, read the political cartoons, and read the poem by Alejandro Perez, and write your 200 to 300 word response on a detail related to the people or the settings in one of these texts. More discussion of this prompt is at the end of this lecture. So again, your task for this week is to have engaged with all of the primary sources that are listed, but you will only be writing about one of them. Okay, so this all kind of organizes itself into the first concept we're going to really talk about for the semester, which is flash findings. And this is the process of watching or reading a text and immediately responding to it by creating a list of details, concepts, or characters that stand out to you as significant for understanding what the text is arguing or what its overall meaning is. So flash findings is all about first impressions, right? What immediately sticks out to you? what stands out to you, what catches your eye, what makes you more interested. It doesn't have to be solidified necessarily. Um, an analysis is all about kind of taking your time to get to know the text and to be able to kind of write and produce an analysis that's very well-rounded, that's well-researched, that's very thoughtful. Flash findings are step one. So at this point, we're not worried as much about the conclusion, the concluding outcome right? The flash findings are all about what are my first impressions of the text and how am I starting to narrow in or focus in on this text by identifying some critical details or kind of crucial elements of this text that I need to attend to to be able to talk about this, what this text is doing and what this text is saying, okay? Now, there are two ways we can break down flash findings. That is kind of two details that we can focus in on, which of course there are other ways as well to engage with the text that we will be talking about this semester. But for now, we're gonna be focusing on these two subcategories, okay? The first is observations about people. Um, and you know, here I kind of use in the music video that you just watched as sort of a starting point. Um, and I'll kind of elaborate on that in a moment. But examples of what to pay attention to when it comes to observing people in a text might be costumes, makeup, ensembles, movement, voice, lyrics, facial expressions, and body language, right? The music video is gonna kind of be the, I guess, first category or genre, if you will, that we're gonna to look to um, when thinking about kind of what a pop culture analysis could consist of, okay? And so when we think about a visual text like a music video, it allows us to see some of these details um, in ways that kind of perhaps wouldn't be operating the same way as if we are reading a poem or looking at a comic, right? Um, and so you can also, observe and analyze the significance of people in a text like a poem or a comic, but given that they are different kinds of visual texts, right, you're going to have to kind of look for these details a bit differently than you would in something like a music video or a film. Now, the second subcategory of flash findings is observations about settings. Uh, and examples of what to pay attention to might be colors, objects, decorations, background noise, sound, scenery, writing, location, 
right? Now, I wanna just kind of emphasize that with people, we have something like um, lyrics, right? So kind of the um, words that we're seeing or hearing someone perform. And with settings, we might be getting sounds that are slightly different or background noise that might be slightly different, such as like an air horn in the background or street noise in the background, right? So when we're thinking about kind of the different forms that things could be arriving in, they might be related to each other, but not necessarily identical, right? Now, same goes with like thinking about people. Um, we want to be attentive to what does somebody's face look like when they're making their point? Do they look nervous? Do they look excited? Do they look comfortable? Um, you know, you can kind of think about, you know, TV shows that are like, um, I don't know, procedurals or kind of um, cop shows, right? Oftentimes those will really emphasize the facial expression um, of the person being interrogated or the one who's doing the interrogating. Um, we also want to think about body language and movement. Are we getting choreography? Are we getting someone who's standing in place performing? Are we getting something where multiple bodies are moving in a space, right? Um, we want to think about colors and that applies to the lighting. Is there, are there like lighting cues and changes in the text that we're engaging with? Um, are those represented to us visually? Are they written out in a novel and described to us, right? Um, where are things taking place? These are just some examples of how you can kind of build up your flash findings toolkit. Um, now, of course, there might be ways that you pick up on details that differ from people and settings, but these are gonna be kind of our first two subcategories for thinking about how you might pay attention to what a text is doing. So for this week's primary sources, you have a few different options. The first of which is Donnie Trumpet and the Social Experiments Sunday Candy short film. Now, this is a text that I find generally can be really um, useful as a point of entry into kind of music video analysis, given that you do have lots of choreography, you have moving sets, you have kind of two primary narrators as the two lead singers um, in this, right? Um, you have kind of a lot of movement and lighting and just things that are kind of moving and just changing constantly in this particular music video. Um, so if you were to choose to kind of um, write about this text in your discussion board post for this week, you would need to kind of focus in on what, sorry for the lighting change that just happened. Um, you'd want to focus in on one detail from this text um, that really solidifies for you something, you know, that's kind of um, just meaningful and interesting to pay attention to, which I'll elaborate on more when I get to the prompt. But you also want to make sure that you're watching and engaging with text more than once. Watching this music video one time and then writing about it is probably not going to be the most sophisticated strategy for being able to really talk about how something develops. So I encourage you each time that you watch this music video that you maybe pay attention to different details, like a particular set, a particular background dancer, a particular costume, right? Focus in on different parts throughout the video and you'll notice how just kind of your attention, but also how your reading of this text might change. The next text that you're going to be looking at is Jeremy Zucker's All the Kids Are Depressed. Um, this one I want to give a content warning for. It definitely talks about kind of depression and anxiety, um, but I think what I'm excited about with this text is that this is an opportunity for you to also once again have um, different characters that you could be focusing in on. You do have a primary narrator, um, but if you choose to write about this music video, you might want to think about the significance of the setting of some of the houses, the neighborhood, right? Um, kind of how that perhaps plays into how this narrative is being conveyed to us. Um, we get a lot of different people and a lot of different testimonies and stories in this text. How might this music video be kind of making sense of the meaning through each of these different elements? You also have Selena Gomez's De Una Vez. Um, now, if you do not speak Spanish, that's totally fine. Um, you could opt to write about this music video um, without knowing what the lyrics are saying. You could opt to write about this music video by also looking up the English translation and then kind of connecting backwards. Um, if you do speak Spanish, you can kind of elect to write about just the music video or the lyrics, either one. Um, but I do want to kind of impress that this is one that's really interesting because you have so many um, things moving around inside of the home space. So it's really helpful to kind of attend to where is this character located? Do we have more than one primary character or narrator? 
And when we think about a music video, generally the singer or kind of the group that's singing the song can be understood as the narrator or the primary character or the protagonist who's tracking us through whatever the um, kind of narrative is. And when it comes to a music video, what we're getting when we look at these different scenes is we're getting something called a music video treatment. And the treatment is going to be the story that is kind of provided to the video that's going to complement or extend or complicate what the lyrics are telling us initially, because generally we hear the song you know, a month or a couple months in advance, and then we see the music video after the fact. So if you elect to write about a music video this week, you might want to think a little bit about how each of these texts are perhaps extending or building out the story world of the song. Are they doing something that's surprising or shocking or different than maybe what might, one might assume if they had just listened to the song? Um, or are they doing kind of a very exact, you know, interpretation, right? Um, and you want to also be attentive to, you know, do other people even show up in this text or is it just one person? Um, do we see no people, right? So again, in thinking about observations about people and settings, with these music videos, you can really kind of um, start out by, you know, ideally making a list, having some sort of piece of paper or even digital paper in front of you and just kind of jot down your first impressions. Um, and again, with each of these videos, it can be useful to focus on a different detail, um, you know, each time that you watch it. Generally, I found that with music videos, it can be helpful to kind of start out by watching each one two or three times. They are short, so it's not kind of exhaustive to do such, um, but it can be a really helpful strategy for making sure that you're kind of looking at different parts of the um, scenery of, you know, noticing where maybe a detail that's subtle the first time you watch it starts to become more obvious the more that you watch it, so on and so forth. Um, so one example or kind of one way that I encourage you to kind of think about um, the Sunday Candy short film is that, you know, in this case, we do have, as I said before, a lot of choreography, a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving people. Um, and I encourage you to kind of think about this particular music video as, an example of how a good essay or an effectively written essay should eventually look and operate. And by that, I mean that, you know, throughout a music video that does have choreography, that has kind of an ensemble cast, right? Multiple people participating in it. You have, you have moments when perhaps, you know, a couple people break off and do their own thing and then eventually return to the group. You have kind of the group as a whole, um, you know, kind of um, moving in unison at some points. Uh, and with an essay, you know, if we think about each of these people as perhaps representing a different paragraph or a different section in an essay, um, you know, each paragraph or section on its own should be compelling, convincing, um, well worked out, right? But ultimately, each of those paragraphs should also contribute to a larger whole. You don't wanna have one paragraph that's so off opposite from everything else that it doesn't make sense when put together with the rest of the pieces of the essay. And so I encourage you when you're watching the Sunday Candy film, um, and ideally watching these texts over again after watching this lecture, that you really pay attention to just kind of how this text visualizes that harmony between different pieces, right? If somebody temporarily moves out of sequence from everyone else, how do they return back to the sequence in a way that's seamless um, and that's not distracting or disorienting, okay? Now, you do have two political cartoons for this week to also look at as well. Um, and both are by Lalo Alcaraz, who is a Chicano artist from um, San Diego. And, you know, for each of these political cartoons, he is referencing other pop culture images, right? So we have smallpox infested blankets, which is from 1995, and Mighty Migra Border Rangers, which is from 1995. Now, I've elected to give you these um, political cartoons from Lalo Alcaraz because I wanted you to kind of just, as we work towards comics later in the semester, I would love for, if you choose to write about one of these, to just kind of think about how is this creator referencing pop culture images that might be familiar to the viewer, right? Um, what might be kind of his rationale for doing so? Um, and in thinking about kind of observations about people and settings, right? Um, each of these have kind of people included, um, and the settings are a little bit more vague 
we definitely have kind of the foreground or the kind of closer to us part of the image being the primary place we're being guided to look. Um, but these can be really good exercises for the discussion board post of just thinking about kind of how is this particular creator electing to use a familiar pop culture image or character and then kind of warping it and distorting it a bit and changing it into something so that the meaning is a bit different. Um, and so this can be a really fascinating option to go with if you find that maybe the music video option is a bit overwhelming to work with at the beginning, but also if you just prefer to work with a static image that doesn't move. Um, and especially I think thinking about color here would be important given that we have these in black and white. Um, what might be the strategy for using that kind of color scheme as opposed to lots of color and lots of eye catching um, just, you know, color schemes and patterns. And then finally, you have gray skies at the frontera and frontera means border. And this is by Alejandro Perez. And this is a very short poem. And so I've also opted to assign you a poem because I wanted to kind of give you um, a text that's talking about the US specifically and thinking about the US-Mexico border. Um, and the reason I wanted to have one of these options is because, you know, with the three music videos that you are looking at, if we think back to the introductory lecture when I said that we're going to be talking about Americanness through different facets, right? Um, the three music videos that I've assigned for you are kind of looking at different ways of thinking about Americanness um, in terms of kind of, you know, the individual, um, the collective, right? Belonging to a community or to a group. Um, and, you know, I wanted to kind of give you some options that aren't explicitly talking about kind of US politics um, or identity and just kind of allow you to um, just kind of think about all of the things that can be folded into Americanness, right? That maybe are surprising or unexpected. Um, when it comes to the political cartoons that I assigned for you, I opted to give you those because I wanted you to have an opportunity to kind of look at, again, how a creator is taking something familiar and then changing it in a particular way to have a new message attached to it. Because that really allows us to think about content and form, which we'll talk about this semester, in very different ways. Of what do you do when somebody presents you with something that you already know, but changes something about it so that the meaning making is different. And finally, with this poem, when we're thinking about our observations about people and settings, what's really significant here is that, you know, we're, we're being directed to a very specific place, we're being directed to very specific points in time, we're being kind of directed to specific characters that we know just enough about to get that narrative, um, but it doesn't necessarily build out the same um, full-fledged story world that we get with each of the three music videos for this week, okay? And so again, you're going to be writing about just one of these, but as you look at these texts for this week, I want you to also just kind of pay attention to how each of the form or just, you know, the kind of um, way that it's presented to us, right, with words, with images, um, with um, people moving, choreography, right, how each of those details provides a very different engagement experience for the reader or the consumer or the viewer, as opposed to having only one form available to us. So again, with each of these options, I want you to kind of return back to the text that you've already read or watched by the time you, you engage with this lecture. And I would like you to watch them and read them again, at least once more, ideally two or three times more, and kind of make a list for yourself of what are those flash findings? What are those details that stand out to you? And how might they pertain to people and settings? And it's always ideal to kind of document all of your flash findings. And then by the time you turn to the assignment, do the kind of focusing in there. Um, so making note of all of the things that catch your eye for each of these texts is a great analytical exercise for just kind of like almost clearing out the garage in a way, right? When you go to clean something in your house, you might be thinking, I know that I definitely want to sell this thing or get rid of this thing. But if you kind of start immediately there, you don't necessarily have an organizational system just yet. Um, and so you might get lost or overwhelmed. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, or you might find that you need to kind of um, pause and restart because you don't necessarily have the support in place to accomplish your goal. Okay, sorry about that. Um, had a tickle in my throat again. Um, I guess it's just one of those days <laughs> that the allergies are strong. Um, so yes, okay. So people, settings, right? You wanna engage with text more than once. Um, it's gonna really help you to be able to perform this kind of pop culture analysis in a way that's refined, that's sophisticated, that's in depth. Um, <clears throat> Cause our goal is to go beyond the surface eventually as we work through things, okay?
All right. So key concepts for this class that you should write down and have available to refer back to throughout the semester. It's going to save you time if you write them down. Yes, of course, you have the Google Sites available to you, but you don't want to be opening 52 tabs to, to answer an assignment. So write these concepts down. Keep them close. Keep them near you. Have a notebook, something. Document these concepts. <clears throat> All right. Everything is a text. Um, so in this course, we are working to avoid the pitfalls of assuming that anything that surrounds us in popular culture and society as a whole is devoid of purpose, advertisement, or a larger corporate goal. We don't want to write anything off as meaningless, inherently innocent, or unworthy of critical attention. Um, so that means that everything you are engaging with <clears throat> in your daily life um, can be subject to analysis. Sometimes we're encouraged not to think about certain things as texts like social media posts or reality television um, or video games, right? <clears throat> but what we want to really explore and underscore in this class is that everything is a text and that when we assume that something is not a text, what we actually can end up doing um, is making an assumption that we are not being marketed to, appealed to, um, you know, message to, right? It's just kind of an overview. Um, everything you're engaging with is a source of conflict, messaging, marketing, and so on, okay? <clears throat> so a lot of times when we think about analysis, you know, and this might have been your experience in high school, but a lot of times we're encouraged to think about English classes especially, um, but close reading and analysis more specifically as being connected to literature exclusively. Right. So you might have read something like Lord of the Flies or Romeo and Juliet or The House on Mango Street. And so you might have sort of a select number of plays or short stories or novels <clears throat> that you've been sort of taught are the only options for you to engage with if you want to do analysis. But my job is to kind of broaden that net quite a bit more and to kind of talk to you a little bit about how we can apply some of the strategies we might use to analyze something like a play or literature or something that might be familiar to us because of how the US education system structures um, analysis a lot of times and how we can use some of those things but also build in new tools in our toolkit to really explore um, the vast breadth of pop culture and how pop culture actually offers us way more pathways into thinking about things like Americanness or capitalism um, or you know social justice um, beyond just exclusively looking to one genre or point of entry. <clears throat> And so for me, another rationale for why I want us to spend so much time with pop culture this semester is because I want us to really use the knowledge that you may already have. If you're on Instagram, if you're on Facebook, if you're on Twitter, if you're on TikTok, if you're on Snapchat, though it's a dying platform, um, you already have some knowledge about how pop culture works, right? Um, you might be familiar with, um, in thinking about YouTube, you know, how do particular YouTubers market themselves or comment on what's going on in um, the beauty community or just kind of online more broadly? How are partnerships showing up on TikTok that kind of pull from influential um, brands that kind of combine powers with influencers on platforms um, and kind of change the landscape of what somebody might initially be using TikTok or um, Instagram for, right? How do paid sponsorships kind of infiltrate how somebody might be engaging with documenting their self images? But also like when you go on something like Etsy um, or <clears throat> when you look at somebody sort of like, you know, website where they're selling specific things, what is the language that they're using to identify what their product is or to sell to you or to market to you? Or how are they designing a t-shirt? Because t-shirts, you know, God knows that there's a million of them, but they all have different designs on them that, that, that might ultimately appeal to a different person because of the cut, because of, you know, what's on them and so on and so forth, right? So I want us to fold in all of that knowledge into our discussions this semester. And I want you to be able to kind of bring in things that you may already know about social media and pop culture. And of course, social media is kind of the emergent new arm of what we think of as mainstream media. Um, so mainstream media typically has been understood to be comprised of television, film, radio and advertising um, and kind of magazine publishing, right? <clears throat> and so you might be already familiar with some of those other arms. And so I want us to also consider how social media can, you know, kind of extend or complicate or add to some of those other existing industries. 
Now, a primary source, which is something I've already said, and you're going to hear me saying quite a bit this semester, is a text that materializes an issue, concept, or ideology into a format the creator's audience can engage with through activities like reading, viewing, or listening. In doing so, the author creates a critical space in which the contents of their text can entertain, expose a problem, bring awareness to an issue, represent a group or identity that may often be overlooked or stereotyped, or generate a call to action for the audience. So primary source, right? It's a text that's conveying a message, communicating some sort of messaging to the reader, to the viewer, to the listener. Um, and you know, a creator might not necessarily be setting out to do something super deep, right? Sometimes somebody can create a YouTube video to entertain an audience. Um, sometimes, you know, reality TV, right? A lot of times reality TV is perceived of as being not that deep. Um, and so we can understand that it's kind of a source of entertainment generally. Um, but just because something is designed as a source of entertainment doesn't mean it's not also communicating messages about race, class, gender, sexuality, ability, Americanness, right? So we want to be really attentive to how a primary source can be anything from a poster that hangs in your room to an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians to the social media influencer that you follow on Instagram to even how social media influencers move across platforms and post different content depending on the algorithm and layout of the platform, right? Um, it can be advertisements from any decade. It could be a political poster. It could be a stamp. It could be a physical material object like a teddy bear or an American Girl doll or a board game, right? The possibilities are endless for thinking about what a primary source can be comprised of. But the point is, is that we as pop culture scholars are thinking about how that primary source is a site where me, like me, meaning making is happening, right? The person who's, who's consuming it, who's playing with it, who's engaging with it, might be walking away with ideas about who they are as a person, about other groups of people, about the meaning of something, right? And so our goal is to investigate and interrogate what exactly that is. Now, an important note here is that a primary source will not always carry the same meaning for every audience. As we will discuss throughout the semester, identity, positionality, and other factors may influence why you are interested in, offended by, or can readily understand a text. Now, again, to make sure that we're not essentializing or generalizing, just because somebody is part of a particular community or has a specific identity um, or has a certain life experience does not guarantee a specific outcome in their reaction to a text, right? However, um, depending on what kind of music you listened to growing up, did you go to church? Um, did you um, listen to the radio every weekend? Um, did you read, you know, magazines, right? So on and so forth. Depending on what you were exposed to, what you were not allowed to be exposed to, right? All of these different things can influence perhaps what you're interested in or what you might already know. Um, if you're familiar with a part, particular like pop culture, um, you know, saying or image, right? Where you grew up in terms of neighborhood or country or continent, right? So many different things can influence how somebody arrives to a text, which is why it's so important in our writing to never assume that you have one reader that knows everything that you do, unless you kind of are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like kind of, unless you are specifically publishing somewhere where that might be more possible, okay? Um, so this is an excerpt from the Writer's Companion, a guide to first year writing with excerpts from Writing Analytically, um, which is the textbook that generally is used in English 1110, but I don't assign it, so I included this helpful excerpt to, to kind of just kind of wrap up our conversation about primary sources. Um, and it reads, a primary source might be a poem or an excerpt from a novel, but it might also be a TV or magazine advertisement, a movie trailer, a music video, or even a song. It might be a scene from a film or the cover of a comic book, okay? So they give some examples for what it might look like, though of course this is not an exhaustive list. So in the past, some things that we've looked at in iterations of English 1110 and other first year writing courses I've taught here and at other, another university um, is we sometimes will look at makeup reviews on YouTube. Um, Nima Tang, for example, does um, makeup reviews where she talks about, um, you know, when makeup is advertised to a consumer, what shade ranges are being um, made accessible, um, and how can we perhaps think about the fact that the makeup industry typically prioritizes white and light skin consumers, and so making foundations or concealers or blush of, blushes available to um, dark skinned black women um, does not always get prioritized in the way that it should be. 
sometimes um, in class, we've also talked about brands like Fashion Nova, and they contribute to, you know, contemporary beauty standards and beauty ideals that are not always attainable um, without having to sort of physically or digitally alter oneself. We've talked about things like Disney Channel, original movies, um, you know, comics. Oops. Um, we've talked about, oh no, trying to go back. <laughs> we've talked about um, web comics, um, kind of the composition of how a news broadcast also includes language at the end or kind of the bottom of the screen. Um, you know, different restaurants. We've talked about how politicians rely on slogans in their campaigns, board games, so on and so forth. Um, so just a couple of things we've talked about and things that you could also consider bringing in as well. Um, these are examples of some of the music video texts that have been used in past iterations of 1110 with me. Um, we might use some of these as well in our course, um, but they're also good examples of other texts that you could potentially look to as well as you are thinking ahead to your primary source. Now, a primary source is different from a primary document or a primary artifact, and I really wanna impress this. Now, a primary document or primary artifact, if we're to think back to the textbook definition um, that I provided earlier from the typical 1110 textbook, is it's a text studied by a historian because it was created by a person or people who experienced or were involved in a specific historical event. So examples of this might include letters, treaties, graffiti, and recorded interviews, right? So somebody who was present on you know, a, moment, a momentous day or important day or historical day, they can kind of provide that additional lens or insight into what happened. Um, and so that's going to be something that typically in kind of a historical context is going to be useful for kind of documenting or just thinking about even how things are documented um, from a particular event or period in time. Now we're instead thinking about a primary source, um, not specific to kind of an event in that same respect, we're doing something slightly different. Now, a secondary source is gonna be a companion text that you're gonna kind of be engaging with, especially in the core assignments this semester. And this is your secondary source of ideas and information. This text is used to inform, question, and shape your thoughts about your primary source. A secondary source is a written text. That's what the textbook says. I push that a little bit, um, but they kind of define it as academic papers, magazine or newspaper articles, essays or chapters from books, that examine objects, data, or phenomena and make analytical claims about them. I also would sort into the category of secondary source um, podcasts, interviews with creators, um, you know, kind of uh, YouTube content, right? I, there's kind of a blurred line there for me, which we'll unpack throughout the semester. Um, but in the traditional sense, a secondary source is a written text. But in our course, we're kind of looking at a multimodal approach to a secondary source. So we will unpack that and talk about that more as we go forward. So some examples of secondary sources can look like um, academic books, such as Food Fight um, by Paloma Martinez Cruz or Latinx Superheroes in Mainstream Comics by Frederick Luis Aldama. Other things could be articles in, in the popular press, such as the Spotify one shown at the top. Um, or when Disney Plus came out, that was something we talked about in a past iteration of 1110 that we kind of thought about, you know, how was the popular press writing about documenting this arrival? Um, you also can kind of look at articles in academic journals, right? There's so many different options um, to be kind of looking at. And our goal is to combine the popular press, which we can think of as, you know, um, magazines and newspapers that circulate in our culture and the broader media scape. We're going to combine that pop press, or that popular press approach with, you know, an academic press approach and journals and articles, um, full on books and so on and so forth. So we'll unpack that throughout the semester as well. So let's talk about the prompt for discussion board post number one. Now that we've kind of walked through what your primary sources for this week are that you've engaged with, as well as talked about some of the definitions you'll need to have going forward. So you'll notice that the prompt for discussion board post number one is also the same as the prompt for discussion board post number two. Now, throughout the semester, you will be required to complete four discussion board posts and submit them through our Carmen page. Um, but as I'll kind of remind you at the end of this um, prompt, discussion board posts one and two have the same prompt, but three and four are gonna be a little different. So each discussion board post counts for 15 points and is due on the Sunday of the assigned week at 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Each discussion board post should be submitted through the discussions tab on our Carmen page. The discussion board that is active for that week will always be pinned to the top of the page. Late submission policy. If for whatever reason you cannot submit the discussion board post by the deadline, you may submit it up until the last day of the month in May, June, and July. 
not August. We have a couple of our um, end of semester deadlines that fall under August. You can't submit that work up until the last day of the month. Um, I will not accept discussion board posts after the last day of the month unless we discuss a deadline extension for you in advance. Late submissions of discussion board posts should be emailed to me at sweeney.464 at buckeyemail.osu.edu. I want you to be sick of the words Sunday at 11.59 p.m. Eastern and sweeney.464 at buckeyemail.osu.edu. I want those to just be plugged into your brain because you need those to make it in this class. So again, when you go to Carmen, go to that discussions tab and it will take you over to um, the pin discussions and just kind of other discussions here. You'll notice that only discussion board post number one is currently live. Um, the other ones will show up here. Um, but discussion board post number one is due this Sunday. That is the recommended weekly deadline that you do have until the last day of the month in May to turn it in if you cannot complete it by this Sunday. Now here's the requirements for this discussion board post prompt. On weeks that you are assigned a discussion board post, you are tasked with writing a response of 200 to 300 words to one of that week's primary sources and secondary sources. One. One. Do not write about all of them. No. One. Write about one text. One, one, one. The primary sources assigned each week will typically be multiple music videos, zines, and poems, and so on, while the secondary sources will often be one or multiple short readings that relate to the themes of the primary sources. In this case, this week, you only have primary sources. The poem that we have um, falls under the primary source category because it's not a lens text to talk about the themes and the others. In your response to the text, you are not required to produce an argument or in-depth analysis. Rather, your task is to identify and discuss a specific detail or issue in the text that you consider important and interesting to pay attention to. This detail or issue should correspond to the text content, its message or argument, or form, how it looks or how it is presented to the viewer. Your goal is to observe something interesting in the text that make it effective in making an argument, telling a story, or communicating a message. Okay, so again, we've got three types of form this week. We've got music videos, we've got political cartoons, and we've got poem. Um, now, in terms of content, that's going to be the message or argument communicated through each of the respective texts, okay? So your goal is that you need to be able to talk about how the messaging of the text is influenced or informed by the, the form, right? So in kind of the message that Alejandro Perez tries to communicate through the poem, right? How does the poem as the format maybe allow for certain things to come through really clearly, or maybe certain things aren't working? Um, in Selena Gomez's uh, De Una Vez music video, right? Are certain things coming through to us be, that maybe wouldn't have been possible to kind of pick up on if we were left, left exclusively with a song version of it instead of one that also had a music video treatment, right? So you're thinking about the interconnectedness of the content and the form together, and you want to be able to observe something that makes kind of that like indicates for us just how this text is effective in making an argument, telling a story, or communicating a message. All right. Oh, sorry, I have like a little tickle my nose still. Um, so in your response, you might consider any of the following options or come up with your own. Um, so these are samples of what you could write about with your um, primary sources for the week or secondary sources in some cases. The first of which is compelling visuals. How does the text form the visuals? Communicate a message or argument, the content to the viewer. Is the form effective in getting this message to resonate with the viewer? Why or why not? Are there limitations to who can relate to or identify with this message, storyline, or argument? Okay, so you're thinking about that interconnectedness here between form and content. Um, is the form the most conducive for being able to convey this message in an effective and convincing manner? And who's the who's the audience for this? Right? How can we tell? The second option is made in the USA. How does this text represent or complicate how we define Americanness? And again, this is just kind of a container term that we're using that it's up to you to define all semester. Does it put forth a patriotic view of Americanness or a more critical view? Does it represent a diversity of people? If so, how and why might it do so? Okay, um, so does this text fall into a very kind of um, basic expected definition of Americanness, right? That's maybe wrapped up in patriotism. Is this text perhaps more critical of Americanness or the US? Okay, unpack those things. How can we tell? How do the form of content help us? Flash findings, people. What observations can you make about how people or the protagonist, the main character, are represented in the text? 
How does the text make use of details like makeup, costuming, an ensemble, body language, etc., to communicate an idea or theme or to tell a story? So for this option, you would be focusing in on one critical detail related to people and kind of unpacking for us how it helps to mediate that person in the text and kind of, you know, engage them with the messaging, the form, and so on. And then flash finding settings, what observations can you make about how the setting is portrayed in the text? How does the text make use of details like colors, objects, decorations, sound, etc., to communicate an idea or theme to tell a story, okay? So here you'd be focusing on the settings. Um, and so you might find that if in the course of your flash findings with this week's assigned primary sources, if you just like right away found something with the people or settings that jumped out at you, it might be your best strategy to go with one of those prompts. Whereas maybe um, if you're instead interested in talking instead about form and content or about Americanness exclusively, the first two options might be more ideal. Now I want to just like kind of emphasize here that the discussion board posts are low stakes assignments, meaning that they are meant to act as an opportunity for you to observe and reflect on what you watched or read for that week. They are exploratory assignments rather than argumentative ones that is focused more on brainstorming and generating ideas about why a text might be structured the way it is, rather than concentrating on trying to provide a conclusion or assessment for it, okay? So I want you to select your critical detail and really focus on it, talk about it, analyze it. What is its significance? What is it contributing to the text? What is it doing? What is it maybe helping to make clear uh, or make exciting? Or what is it maybe doing that prevents the text from being exciting or engaging, okay? And an important note, again, is that discussion board posts number one and two should be responded to using this prompt, but discussion board posts number three and four will have different prompts, okay? So this is the prompt that you have for this week. It will be different for three and four, but one and two will use this prompt. All right. So that is everything that I have for you today. Um, I know, again, you've gotten kind of both lectures from me on the same day um, that will occasionally happen, but generally I record them at different points. I try to get them up on Mondays, um, but it's the first day and I'm excited to kind of dive into things with you. If you have any questions, any worries, any, concern, and any concerns whatsoever, please don't hesitate to let me know. Um, I will generally reach out to you over Carmen message each week just to kind of give you a heads up when things are posted, um, but I am so excited to have you in class. I hope that that's coming through. Um, we think we had a quiet lecture this time without cat um, interruption, um, and I appreciate so much in advance your patience with street noise, with cat interruptions in general this semester as we go forward. But yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be a good time. I hope that you're already excited and interested. If you're panicking, let me know. I don't have office hours this week, of course, because we are starting on Wednesday, but my first office hours will be on Monday from 11 o'clock a.m. to 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern, but I'm happy to meet with you at an alternate time if that time does not work. All right, everyone, take care. I'm wishing you the best of luck for this work for this first week of work. Um, <laughs> I always stumble over my words, so we'll get used to it. Um, but either way, excited to have you, excited to do this work this semester, and I hope that you have a great rest of your week. Bye.